Hey everybody, welcome to Dakari's 24th virtual fire investigative training session. Today we have Andy Cox, and Andy Cox is an ATF certified fire investigator out of our New Hampshire field office. Uh, and today we're going to talk about something called the origin matrix and determining um, how fires start in compartments. So, uh, Andy, go ahead. Yeah, so as, as part of the discussion related to origin matrix analysis, we're going to cover some basic fire science principles and compartment fire dynamics as a bit of a review. And then we're going to get into the meat and potatoes and the material and discuss some damage dynamics and go over some both small scale and large scale experimental results. And finally wrap up with some uh, additional considerations. But before we get started, I really want to just talk a little bit about this fire investigation process. And so you and I as fire investigators, we, we are routinely attempting to relate the fire effects and patterns that we observe at a fire scene to known fire growth and development behavior so that we can determine both the origin and cause of the fire. And so I've got a little diagram here that helps illustrate some of this. If we look at an event progression, the event starts with this uh, issue of cause. So a first fuel and ignition source come together to start a fire and that generates an exposure in our area of origin. And then the fire continues to grow and develop and spread beyond that area of origin. Uh, and hopefully at some point in time, the fire department responds uh, and puts the fire out and conducts some overhaul operations. And that is our event progression. And what that leaves us at the end is with this uh, set of damage effects and patterns that you and I get to look at as a fire investigator. So down below here, I've got kind of a concept diagram of each one of these steps. So each step in the event progression generates an imprint that you and I get to look at. And that imprint is some sort of effect or pattern. And so the cause generates an imprint. The origin also de generates an imprint. And then the fire growth spread and, and development behavior generates imprints along the way. And ultimately, the fire department uh, suppression and overhaul operations can also impart a set of effects and damages to a fire scene. And what we are left with is this conglomeration or accumulation of effects and patterns that you and I get to look at after the fact. Now, those uh, effects and patterns are all layered over the top of each other. And we have to uh, work to analyze this scene, to segregate and separate each one of those imprints, to hopefully assign them uh, as to where they came from during the event progression and lead us back to an origin and hopefully ultimately cause. And so that's what we are doing uh, as fire investigators. We're working backwards in effect from the event progression. So with that, let's move on to some basic fire science principles. So the first issue here is the fire triangle. And uh, there's not a fire investigator in the country that hasn't uh, studied the fire triangle. But what's different about my fire triangle here is this concept of fuel gases instead of just fuel. Now that is a really, really important issue because solids and liquids don't burn. It's the gases that solids and liquids give off when heated that burn. Okay. And so we really want to talk about this fire triangle, or at least the fuel portion of the fire triangle, in terms of fuel gases. Uh, and then typically the oxygen component of the fire triangle is coming from the oxygen that's present in our ambient air. So let's move on from the fire triangle and talk a little bit about flame anatomy. And so flames exist generally where there is an interface of fuel gases and oxygen, assuming there's enough heat present in the system. Uh, if It's that interface that is important. And if you, if you think about uh, a fire plume that exists outside a window. Sure. That's an illustration of this interface. So we have heated fuel gases escaping a fire compartment, mm -hmm. and as they uh, interface with the oxygen that's outside that compartment, they then burn. So uh, this is a really, really important concept because it dictates where, in fact, flames are going to exist inside a compartment as well as outside. So with that in mind, Let's move on to some uh, tabletop experiments that can help illustrate some of these principles. All right, so what we've got here is a simple candle experiment that will enable us to uh, talk about some of these principles that are important to us as fire investigators. Uh, above the candle, suspended above the candle, we have a wire mesh screen 
Uh, and what you're gonna see here is I'm gonna lower this wire mesh screen down into the candle flame. And you tell me what you see uh, happening to the flame as I do that, Bill. Sure. Flame is diminishing, and I don't see any flaming combustion up here. With yeah, so, so the top of the flame goes out. Mm -hmm. Got any idea why that might be? Uh, it's disseminating the heat across the screen? Yeah, exactly. So we are removing essentially one component of the fire triangle, and that is heat. The wire mesh screen uh, conducts a lot of heat energy away from that flame very, very quickly and quenches it, puts it out. And what that enables us to do now is look down on this candle flame and we can see a really interesting behavior. Uh, so I've got a picture here of uh, a candle flame that has been um, impacted by a wire mesh screen. And when we look down, directly down on it, what we can see is this ring of flames that exists. And inside, there's no flames. You can see the black of the wick, uh, but there's no flames inside this ring. What do you suppose is going on inside there? Uh, it's fuel rich. Exactly right. So what we have is the heat from the flame itself is impacting the wax that's inside the wick and causing it to gasify. So we have this fuel-rich environment inside. Outside that ring of flame, what we have is a lot of fresh air that contains oxygen. And just like we talked about previously, it's the interface between the oxygen that's on the outside and the heated fuel gases that are on the inside uh, is where we have flaming conditions and it creates that ring of flame. So if we were to allow this uh, wire mesh screen to remain in place for quite some time, what we might actually see is that flame would begin to bleed back through after sufficient time. And the reason for that is the wire mesh screen heats up to a point that it's no longer an effective heat sink and it can't take enough energy away from the flame and the flame will bleed back through. Now we're gonna move on to another tabletop experiment here involving the candle where we utilize a beaker that is in effect a compartment and we're going to lower this beaker down over the flame and we'll watch what happens. I want you to specifically look at the size of the flame and how that changes over time. Okay. Starting to diminish and flicker almost like it wants to go out. And so what do you suppose is happening here? It's removing the oxygen. Exactly. So uh, this beaker acts as a compartment that collects the heated uh, smoke and fuel gases that are accumulating above the uh, flame itself. Those uh, heated gases and smoke are deficient in oxygen. And so in effect, what we are doing is continually removing oxygen from the environment until we've removed so much oxygen that the flame can no longer exist and it goes out. We remove that leg of the fire triangle. But an interesting uh, alternative is we can do a similar experiment where we utilize a beaker that has a small hole created in the top. And that's gonna look a little different. Similar in some ways, but different in others. And so let's lower this beaker down and watch what happens. So you can see some of that smoke rising out of the top of the container. And if some of the smoke and heat is allowed to escape, what do you suppose is allowed to enter the system? Uh, more oxygen from the bottom. Exactly. And so theoretically what we, sh we should see here is the flame will begin to diminish in size, but it may actually stabilize at a smaller flame size. But comparatively speaking, that flame is significantly smaller than it was when the compartment was not in place. This type of behavior is happening in full-scale compartment fires every day. There's a limited amount of oxygen available to fires inside buildings. Some of the smoke and heat is escaping through either maybe a small opening in a window or gaps and cracks that exist in the construction, and that allows some fresh air to come in. Uh, to support the fire, but it only will support a fire of limited size. Just like in this case, the flames diminished. This fire wants to be this size as we see it right now, but when we compartmentalize it with limited ventilation, 
the fire can only be uh, a size that is associated with the amount of fresh air that can come in. That makes sense. There are some compartment fire dynamics that are really important for fire investigators to understand. And if we look into our NFPA 921 Guide for Fire and Explosion Investigations, you'll see some diagrams that look like this one we have here on the screen. And for that matter, if you look at any number of uh, fire-related text, whether it's fire investigation or suppression, uh, you'll see similar types of diagrams. And what we show here, or is depicted here, is a diagram of early compartment fire development. And we have a fire in a chair uh, of a residential-sized room. That fire is producing smoke and heat, which is rising in a column above the flames uh, and then impacting the ceiling. That, that column of smoke and heat is uh, referred to as a plume. When that plume impacts the ceiling, the smoke and heat spreads laterally across the ceiling and starts to generate a, uh, a layer of smoke and heat at the upper regions of the compartment. If we move on to the next phase of fire growth and development, we allow this fire that's in the chair to continue to grow and it gets a little bit bigger and it's producing more heat and more smoke. So the plume gets a little bit larger and that smoke and heat is accumulating uh, at the ceiling level and starting to uh, descend down towards floor level. And if we have an opening like we see here, this doorway opening, some of that smoke uh, and heated gases are going to escape out the top of the door and spill into adjacent compartments. But the general flow path of airflow in this environment is we have fresh air coming in to the base of the fire down low. That provides the oxygen component for the fire to continue to burn. And then the heated fuel gases, which are deficient in oxygen, rise above uh, in that plume and spread across the ceiling and then exit out the top regions of the compartment. So now let's go to the next phase of fire development where we've allowed this fire that's in the chair to continue to grow and develop and this upper layer descends significantly lower to the floor. This upper layer contains a lot of heat energy at this point and because smoke is made up of lots of little tiny carbon particles, this smoke layer is really efficient at radiating energy down towards the physical fuel items that exist closer to floor level below that upper layer. And that radiant heat energy now creates a situation where these physical fuel items are now pyrolyzing. They're giving off a gas that is in effect a fuel that the fire eventually may be able to consume. So if we continue to the next phase of fire development, what we see here is the flashover condition in a compartment fire. And for a brief period of time, what we may see here is there's enough oxygen and enough heat in the system that this room bursts into flames. Now, it's not necessarily wall-to-wall, -wall, floor to ceiling flames, but what we see is that there may be a brief period where large volumes of the compartment are engulfed in flames. But this is very, very short-lived because this much bigger fire condition is consuming oxygen at a very high rate, and it becomes an oxygen-deficient environment. And then we extend into this post-flashover or full room involvement phase of fire growth and development. And in this phase, we have uh, an oxygen deficient environment that really cannot allow for flames to exist throughout large volumes of the space. And so we may only get flaming conditions nearer ventilation openings that are supplying fresh air. Now this diagram is okay, but it can be misleading in the sense that what you see here in this region is the flames appear to be attached to a physical fuel item and that's not necessarily the case. And to help illustrate that, let's look at a typical flashover cell. So this flashover cell was obtained from a video presentation from the Oak Ridge Fire Department and they did a great job of putting together this flashover cell. And what we see here is a fire condition in a chair in the corner of a room but the cell itself has essentially an entire wall missing. There's just a soffit here at the top that allows some of that heat and smoke to accumulate at the upper regions of the compartment. As this fire continues to grow, you can see we've developed this layer height or this condition where that smoke and heat exists in the upper regions of the compartment. And that heat condition is radiating tremendous amounts of energy down towards these physical fuel items that exist 
at the lower regions of the compartment. Now, if this fire allow, is allowed to progress further, we may go through this flashover transition. And for those of you that have seen flashover cell demonstrations, uh, it's quite dramatic. This room literally bursts into flames, and all appearances are that you do, in fact, have wall-to-wall, -wall, floor to ceiling flames. But this type of flashover can be a little misleading because it's not uh, a similar condition or does not equate to the fires that you and I would investigate that have much smaller ventilation openings. In this case, there's essentially an entire wall missing, which supplies unlimited fresh air to the interior of the compartment. If we were to look at a more traditional compartment fire, where there's just a doorway opening in this particular case, what we see is the flames and smoke and heat exiting the top of the doorway and fresh air entering the compartment, but there's a limited amount of fresh air, just like in that candle experiment that we saw earlier. There's a limited amount of fresh air that can only support a fire of a certain size inside that space. And it limits the fire to something much less than wall-to-wall -wall floor to ceiling flames. So the takeaway here is that the flashover cell conditions that you see up top versus the compartment fire conditions that you see down bottom are not the same. When you look at this picture down at the bottom and you look in that doorway, it appears that there may in fact be a room that is engulfed in flames, but that is not the case. As we get deeper into this compartment beyond the visible flames that you see, there is insufficient oxygen to allow flames to exist. So to help illustrate this concept, let's look at a hypothetical compartment fire. And what you're looking at here is a plan view of a compartment where we have an open doorway that is offset from the center. And these dotted lines that crisscross in the center are not walls. It's just an arbitrary division so that you and I can speak analytically about this space. Sure. And let's start a hypothetical fire in this upper left-hand quadrant one and think about it analytically. In the pre-flashover compartment fire conditions, the heat of that fire is going to impact the physical fuel item that's burning and cause it to pyrolyze and give off fuel gases. Those fuel gases immediately mix with oxygen that's available and we meet the components of our fire triangle in that general area. And so, Pre-flashover, this is where our fire conditions primarily exist, in our area of origin. Elsewhere in the compartment, there's still plenty of oxygen, but there's insufficient heat and fuel gases for fire conditions to exist. And this is illustrated by those first three diagrams that we looked at previously. Now, if we allow this fire that we started in quadrant one to progress through flashover, the heat of that fire that started here in quadrant one begins to accumulate or stack up in the space such that we get to a point where all of the physical fuel items in that space begin to give off fuel gases. And those fuel gases fill large volumes of the compartment. And for a brief period of time, we may have sufficient oxygen throughout large volumes of the space so that those uh, heated fuel gases can ignite and create a flaming fire condition throughout large volumes of the space. But that is very, very short-lived, just like we talked about previously, because we are quickly consuming the oxygen component of the fire triangle because of that large fire condition that exists. This is where things change. When we go into the post-flashover compartment fire environment, we now have a room that is full of heated fuel gases. That flashover transition has consumed much of the oxygen in the space. And now we have a condition where the only oxygen that's entering the space is via this open doorway. So if you recall, we have smoke and heated fuel gases that will be escaping the top of the doorway. And replacing that is the fresh air that contains oxygen down low. And when that fresh air enters the compartment, it's immediately impacting or meeting heated fuel gases, and consuming. And so we meet the components of our fire triangle in an area associated with this doorway vent. Deeper into the compartment, we have a lot of heat, we have a lot of fuel gases, but we simply don't have oxygen of sufficient quantity to allow flaming fire conditions to exist.
And this is a really, really important transition for fire investigators, and we'll talk more about that later. But this is where we ran into a little bit of a problem. So that final diagram that we looked at in 921, uh, I would argue is a little bit misleading. We could do a better job. So it's worth noting that in the 2014 edition of 921, that post flashover or full Roman uh, involvement diagram looked like this, where flames were physically attached to all of the physical items in the room that were burning in that post flashover fire environment. And that is very clearly incorrect because we don't necessarily have sufficient oxygen for those flames to exist. So in the 2017 edition and now the 2021 edition, we have an updated diagram that looks like this here. Uh, and there's an improvement. What you see here is that in the deeper regions of the compartment, away from our vent opening, we don't have flames existing on these items. Why? Because the oxygen can't get back there. Uh, it gets consumed before it gets deeper into the compartment. And so there's no flaming condition, but the environment is hot. And that heated environment causes these two physical fuel items to give off fuel gases. Those gases just can't burn at that location because of the lack of oxygen. Now over here, the diagram depicts flames existing at the chair itself. And that may or may not be the case. I think it would be more appropriate for us to look at a diagram or generate a diagram that looks more like this, where the flames would exist at the interface between the incoming fresh air, which contains oxygen, and the heated fuel gases, which have accumulated throughout the space. So in effect, this is a candle flame turned on its side sure. with one distinct difference. Previously, the interior of the candle flame was fuel rich, right? Mm -hmm. And the outside of the candle flame was the fresh air environment that contained oxygen. We flip-flopped that. Here, this incoming fresh air, the inside of that flame is where our fresh air and oxygen exists. It's the outside that then contains the heated fuel gases, and this red line depicts the interface between those two where flames would exist. And that means that those flames don't necessarily remain attached to any physical fuel item. And that's really, really critical for us to understand as fire investigators because it impacts where we're generating damage. And we're not necessarily de generating damage at a physical item anymore. What's interesting about this diagram and the other diagrams is that we have always gotten this concept correct on the exterior. In every one of these diagrams, we correctly depict flames existing at the interface between the heated fuel gases that are escaping and the fresh air that contains oxygen on the outside. That same concept we need to apply to the inside here. Uh, and I think the diagram that currently exists in NFPN and 21 is slightly misleading in that regard. So here's a uh, picture of a compartment fire that was uh, created at the ATF Fire Research Laboratory just outside of Washington, D.C. And what you see here is this is an open doorway opening. You see the heated fuel gases that are escaping are burning because they're mixing with the fresh air on the exterior. And what you can see here, in effect, is this tunnel of fresh air that's entering the compartment. And that tunnel of fresh air is supplying the limited oxygen to create the burning that we can visibly see. But as we get deeper into the compartment back here, there's no flames. In fact, there's a window port right here with fire rated glass where you can't see any glow or flaming conditions. And that's because there's insufficient oxygen, oxygen. back there. Interestingly, if you look at uh, a number of firefighter accounts associated with near misses where people are getting caught in uh, that flashover transition, firefighters will often talk about this tunnel of visibility that led them back to the exit. And that tunnel of visibility is nothing more than that fresh air inflow. 
So now let's move on to applying some of these concepts of compartment fire dynamics to how it generates damage within the space. We've discussed some basics of fire science and compartment fire dynamics, and now what I want to do is relate those concepts to the damages that they generate within a fire scene. And those are the damages that you and I get to look at after the fact. So with that in mind, uh, we as fire investigators are interested in those fire effects and fire patterns uh, because they give us clues about the nature of fire that caused them, or hopefully they give us clues about the nature of the fire that caused them. And specifically, we may be interested in three aspects of that damage. The first is the location of damage, and that may give us some insight over issues like origin, whether or not flashover occurred, and ventilation-related exposures. And then we're also interested in the magnitude of the damage, because that can tell us something about the severity of the cumulative exposure that existed. And then finally, we're also interested in the shape of damage, because that can give us some clues about the direction from which the exposure may have come. And I want to make a note here that the language I'm using is slightly different than what has traditionally been used in NFPA 921. NFPA 921 has talked about movement and intensity patterns. Sure. Uh, I tend not to like that language because it has a tendency to make me think of the fire rather than the damage. Mm -hmm. And so instead of uh, intensity, I like to use magnitude of damage. That's our starting point. Now that magnitude of the damage may tell us something about the intensity of the fire, mm -hmm. but I like that magnitude language better. And same with shape of damage. Mm -hmm. um, that shape that we see that is the damage pattern may tell us something about fire movement, but the movement is the fire itself. That's our interpretation of the shape that we see. So let's first talk about this issue of location of damage. And let's go back to our uh, hypothetical compartment fire. Again, this is a plan view. We're looking down on this compartment. We have an open door that's offset from the center. And just as a reminder, these dotted lines that crisscross in the middle are not walls. It's just an arbitrary division for us to talk about this space analytically. So let's start our fire here in quadrant one, just as we did before. And now let's add a layer of um, damage to the equation. So pre-flashover, our fire that started in quadrant one is producing heat. That heat immediately impacts the physical fuel items that are in the area, causing them to give off fuel gases. Those heated fuel gases then mix with the oxygen that exists throughout the space, and we meet the components of our fire triangle in that general area. So pre-flashover, we add a layer of damage in this area. If we put the fire out right now, mm -hmm. you and I as fire investigators are gonna get this right all day long <laughs> because the uh, most significant and prominent damages are associated with origin. But if we let this fire progress to flashover, things get a little more complicated because now the fire that started here in quadrant one has produced a lot of heat that has accumulated in the space, causing all of the physical fuel items in this space to give off fuel gases. And for a brief period of time, we might have sufficient oxygen so we get large volumes of fire throughout the space and that generates a layer of additional damage on top of what occurred previously during the pre-flashover environment. If we put the fire out now, again, it's a little more complicated, but we're probably gonna get this right time and time again because once again, our area of origin is associated with the most significant and prominent fire damages that exist after the fact. It's the next step in fire growth that really throws us a loop as fire investigators. So when we go into this post-flashover fire environment, the fire that originated back here in quadrant one has essentially gone out back here in quadrant one because of insufficient oxygen. That flashover transition consumed all of the available oxygen in the space such that we can't have flaming conditions deeper in the compartment. The flaming conditions exist only in an area associated with our vent, and in this case it's the doorway vent, 
because where smoke and heat is escaping the top of the doorway, we have fresh air entering down bottom, providing oxygen, and as soon as that oxygen enters the compartment, it mixes with the heated fuel gases that exist throughout the space, and we meet the components of our fire triangle in this area associated with a vent. If we put the fire out right now, we get what I call competing areas of damage. One associated with our origin, but now we have a new area of damage that is prominent and significant associated with our vent. This is where fire investigation starts to get more and more complicated. If we allow this fire to progress further into the post-flashover fire environment, into what I would call longer duration post-flashover, we're going to continue to stack up and accumulate our damages where fresh air enters the compartment. So we're gonna get a continued fire exposure in this area associated with the vent, and that continued fire exposure is going to impart continued damage to this region of the space. And even though we don't have flaming conditions back here in quadrants one, two, and four, it is hot, and that heated environment in a, uh, in a baking manner can continue to impart damages such that we may start to wash away the once distinguishable differences that may have existed between our origin and these other two quadrants. And so in effect, what we see here is that if we go long enough post-flashover duration, our most significant and prominent patterns have little to do with origin and have everything to do with ventilation. So if we take all four of those slides and put them in one picture, what we see here is pre-flashover, our damages exist in our area of origin. We add a layer of damage throughout the space for our flashover transition, but that's on top of our pre-flashover origin-related damages. So uh, our origin is still co-located with our most prominent and significant damages. We go into that post-flashover environment where we uh, transition to damages being generated in an area asso associated with a vent, and we get these competing areas of damage, one associated with the origin, one associated with the vent. And then we go longer term post flashover, and we start to wash away the once distinguishable differences that may have existed between our origin and these other two quadrants. And at the same time, we just continue to impart and stack up a lot of significant damage in our area where we meet the components of our fire triangle and have flaming conditions. Sure. So we can go through this analytical thought process for a fire originating anywhere in this space. So let's start a fire here in quadrant two. Pre-flashover, our damages are essentially going to be uh, around the area of quadrant two. If we add a layer of damage for that flashover transition on top of the pre-flashover damages, we're still gonna have our most prominent damage patterns here in quadrant two where the fire started. We go into that post-flashover environment and now we get competing areas of damage, one associated with our origin and one associated with the vent where the incoming fresh air is allowing flaming conditions to occur. And then we go longer duration post-flashover where we continue to stack up our damages here associated with the vent, and we may wash away the once distinguishable differences that existed between our origin and these two other locations or quadrants. Sure. And we talk about going from the least amount of damage to the most significant damage, like how does that affect what we're seeing here? Yeah, so that's an important lesson to be learned from uh, the fire dynamics and this methodology, that our area of most damage, as you can see in this particular aspect of fire growth and development, is not necessarily associated with origin. In fact, it's associated with our vent. And so while it may be perfectly fine to uh, process and document a fire scene from areas of least to most damage, that doesn't necessarily mean you found the origin at that most damaged area. Sure. It's just the starting point for analysis because that area of most damage may very well be a result of ventilation and not origin. That makes sense. So another hypothetical fire here where we're starting our fire in quadrant three. We can go step through the same process add a layer of damage for flashover, 
But when we go to the next phase here, where we're into that post flashover fire environment, the difference here is that our origin location is co-located with all of the fire flaming conditions that are existing in the post flashover fire environment. So everything is happening in one place, and therefore we're not going to see competing areas of damage in this particular instance. And then finally, we can go through this hypothetical thought process for a fire originating in quadrant four. And again, we add a layer of damage for our flashover transition. Once we go into that post flashover fire environment, we get competing areas of damage, one associated with our origin, one associated with the vent, and then longer duration. We continue to stack up our damages here in the vent, and we may wash away the distinguishable differences that may have existed between our origin and these other two quadrants. I think it's important to talk too about, I mean, when you talk about the ventilation in these scenarios, you're talking about almost floor to ceiling at a doorway versus a, a window. Like how would that change? Yeah, the and those are really, really important issues, uh, which we're going to address as we continue on in the presentation. Okay. So the kicker here is that regardless of where the fire starts, uh, fires that burn well past flashover are anticipated to present similar post flashover fire damage because they're all related to ventilation and not necessarily associated with origin. So if we take all of that work that I just showed you and put it on one sheet of paper, this is what it looks like. And this is how this methodology or thought process was termed the origin matrix analysis, because across the top here, we see different hypothetical origins in the space. Okay. And then down the left axis here, we see different phases of fire growth and development. Um, and this provides you a conceptual roadmap for thinking through very logically and systematically where your origin may have existed and what types of damage you would expect from that origin. And then you can compare that to what you actually observe at the scene. This is, in effect, this diagram here is the scientific method in action because you are hypothesizing about a fire originating in these different locations. Mm -hmm. You're hypothesizing for each one of those locations a fire growing to different phases of development. Mm -hmm. And then you're uh, analyzing and thinking about the damages that you would expect to see for each one of those scenarios and comparing them to the actual damages that you see at your scene. Mm -hmm. It's the scientific method in action. Okay, so we've talked a little bit about location of damage. Now let's talk about some of the factors that affect the magnitude of damage. And I don't really understand why this is not in any textbook, but there's three factors that affect the magnitude of damage, and they're really quite intuitive. It's exposure duration, exposure intensity, and material properties. So let's talk about exposure duration first. If I were to take an oak block of wood and put it in my burning fireplace at home for five minutes, and then reach into that fireplace with some tongs and pull out that oak block after five minutes and extinguish it. Mm -hmm. It's gonna be charred up, but there's likely to still be some significant wood left to that block. Sure. If I take the same or similar oak block of wood and I put it in my fireplace at home for 25 minutes, mm -hmm. and then I reach in there with some tongs and take it out, much more of that wood has been consumed when I compare the two, right? right. The one that's been in the fireplace for longer has experienced a, a greater exposure and therefore has been consumed more significantly. Sure. Makes perfect sense. Yep. The next issue that affects the magnitude of damage is this exposure intensity concept. So if I take an oak block of wood and I put it in my fireplace for five minutes and I take it out and extinguish it, and I take a similar oak block of wood and I put it into a, let's say a crematorium furnace <laughs> for five minutes, yeah. There's probably nothing left of the block that went into the crematorium furnace. Why? Because the intensity of the exposure in that furnace was designed to be ridiculously significant, sure. much more so than my fireplace. And so even though both blocks were exposed to the same duration, mm -hmm. the difference in the intensity of the exposure impacted how much they got burned up. Makes perfect sense. It does. And then finally, we want to talk about material properties. 
So if I take an oak block of wood and I put it, I promise we're almost done with this example. <laughs> if I take an oak block of wood and I put it in my fireplace for five minutes and I take it out and extinguish it, and then we get a similar sized and shaped block of balsa wood mm, sure. and we put it in my fireplace for five minutes, the balsa wood gets more damaged, right? You bud. It's, it's experienced the same duration and intensity of exposure, but the material properties were different such that it was more susceptible to the exposure and therefore it got damaged more significantly. When we talk about material properties, we're also talking about form. So if I take that oak block of wood and I put it in my fireplace for five minutes and I take it out and extinguish it, and then I take a similar oak block of wood and I chip it into shavings, and I take those shavings and I put it in my fireplace for five minutes, the shavings get damaged much more significantly. Why? because we've increased the surface area yep. to mass ratio, and we've, we've introduced it in a form that makes it more susceptible to damage. Again, same duration of exposure, same intensity of exposure, mm -hmm. but the shavings are in a form that's much more susceptible to damage than the block itself. So let's examine these in a little more detail. So here's a photograph that comes right out of NFPA 921. What do you notice about this side of the sofa versus this it side? There appears to be more damage on the right than on the left. Yeah, so we've uh, experienced some greater uh, consumption of material on this right side, mm -hmm. and that may be a result of greater intensity exposure, greater duration of exposure, mm -hmm. or both. Sure. It may also be a result of a disparity in the materials from one side to the other, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So let's talk about these two items. These two items came out of the exact same fire. Mm -hmm. And what we see here is the remains of a wicker basket and the remains of a more substantial solid wood desk. And I think this is an interesting question that I often ask, and it's rhetorical, but which one is more damaged? <laughs> That's very hard to answer. Sure. Why? Right. Because we're comparing apples to oranges. Right. Uh, and that becomes really uh, an important issue for fire investigators to consider because we want to compare apples to apples. Sure, desk to desk, right? Yeah, in order to make good quality analytical decisions about what things might mean. Mm -hmm. So one of the advantages that we have in the typical residential fire scene anyway is a lot of the wall and ceiling surfaces mm -hmm. are of like materials. It's drywall. Yeah. If we're lucky, we go into a living room where there's a furniture set Maybe there's a love seat and a sofa that are the exact same materials. Mm -hmm. One has an additional seat cushion, but otherwise they're, they're the same materials. We can make those apples to apples comparisons. So now let's move on to factors that affect the shape of damage. And it's really the principles of heat transfer and fire dynamics that influence the shape of fire damage. And so the first issue is fire flows. If I showed you a wall with a V or U shape on it, mm -hmm. what would that cause you to think of in terms of fire dynamics? Just where the fire flowed or the plume made contact? Exactly. It would lead you to think about the potential for a plume. Now that does not mean that every V-shaped pattern sure. on a wall resulted from a plume, mm -hmm. but we do know that the convective flows associated with plume dynamics can impart that kind of shape on a wall surface. Uh, then there's also this line of sight issue um, that is associated with radiation heat transfer. Uh, if you can see the exposure, then you will feel the impacts of that exposure. And that's true for materials. If a material can see the exposure, then they will feel the impacts of that. And we'll talk more about that in a second. And then finally, uh, the shape of damage can also be impacted by the material properties and construction features. And, and we'll address that here shortly. So just like we talked about before, the convective flows associated with a plume, you can see them here. When they impact a wall surface, they may in fact impart a certain shape mm -hmm. that we can anticipate. And here's a couple of diagrams or photographs that are out of NFPA 921 that show a little bit of plume damage. In this case, it's from a fire that occurred on a stove. Uh, and then this is a vent plume damage where we've got a doorway here. It appears that a fire occurred inside the room on the other side of the doorway and the escaping flames and gases created 
this shape here uh, consistent with a vent plume. And then this line of sight or radiation issue, uh, if we were to look at uh, a room and contents fire that went through the flashover transition, uh, and you had an end table like here, what would you expect to, to see on the carpet underneath that end table as compared to carpet that was not underneath? An area of protection or protected area? Exactly, and that is because the carpet underneath this table, when it's looking up at that radiation exposure from the heated upper layer, it can't see it because the tabletop is in the way. And therefore, it imparts uh, a shape pattern in the shape of the tabletop of a protected area on the floor. Uh, these are another couple of photographs from NFPA 921 that also depict uh, some heat shadowing from furnishing items that existed in these spaces during a fire condition. We alluded to this issue previously, but one of the factors that also affects the shape of damage involves uh, the material properties and the construction. So you remember previously we looked at a photograph of a sofa that had more damage or, or more mass loss on one side than another. And that may be the case for a sofa that looks like this that was symmetrical to begin with. But nowadays, you can go into a furniture store and buy asymmetric furniture. And if that furnishing item looked like this, after a fire, it may give the appearance that there was more damage or more mass loss on this side when that was not the case at all. There was just less mass to begin with because there's no arm on that side to begin with. Sure. So this is an important type of question that investigators often fail to ask because it's very easy to assume that furnishing items were symmetrical to begin with. But it's important for us to ask that question of an owner or an occupant. Sure. Tell me about that sofa. What did it look like prior to the fire? And you may very well find that that differential damage mm -hmm. isn't differential damage at all. It was a pre-existing condition. Sure. Same goes for beds. We often look at bedding um, and consumption of bedding on uh, a bed surface to determine differential damage. And that may be fine if our bed is made and symmetrical prior to the fire. But if our bed looks like this photograph on the bottom right prior to the fire, where all the blankets are stacked up on one side, we may get a uniform or a more uniform type flashover transition exposure that damages all of this stuff, but after the fact, it doesn't look uniform in nature because prior to the fire, all the material was on one side of the bed rather than the other to begin with. Right. And so here's another instance where it's an important question for us to ask occupants and owners about the pre-fire conditions so that we understand those and can make meaningful uh, evaluations of the post fire damage that we see. Sure. So let's talk a little bit more about shape of damage uh, with our com hypothetical compartment fire that we've discussed repeatedly through uh, the topic so far. What we see here again is this plan view of, of a compartment, an open doorway that's offset from the center. The dotted lines are just an analytical division. They're not walls. This is one space. We'll start a fire up here in our upper left-hand quadrant one. And if you recall, in the pre-flashover uh, compartment fire, the heat from that fire is causing the physical fuel items in that area to give off fuel gases. Those heated fuel gases immediately mix with oxygen. We meet the components of our fire triangle in this area. And therefore, our most prominent damages are physically located in that general area of origin. But now let's take a look at this diagram as an exploded room diagram. And in addition to location, we may actually see some shapes of relevance on our adjacent wall surfaces and our physical fuel items in the space. So again, pre-flashover, all of our damages are generally in our area of origin. If our area of origin is close enough to the wall surfaces, that plume may impart or imprint 
some physical effects and patterns that we can see after the fact, and those effects and patterns may have some shape to them. Uh, and I've drawn, at least conceptually, some shape in these angled lines. That origin-related fire in the pre-flash over fire environment, the plume may impact the ceiling directly above it and create some more significant damages there as well. And then, in addition to those origin-related damages, we also have the upper layer damages associated with the smoke and heated gases that are rising in the compartment. And so we get these horizontal shapes of upper layer damage that exists throughout the space and then uh, a, a somewhat uniform exposure from that upper layer to the ceiling in addition to the plume-related exposure just above the origin. Sure. So now let's continue to step through this hypothetical compartment fire, and we'll transition into the flashover uh, phase of fire growth. So if you recall, our fire started up here in the upper left-hand quadrant one. We've gone through the flashover transition, so in addition to the origin-related damages in this location, we're adding a layer of somewhat more uniform damages throughout the space for that flashover transition. And let's look at the types of shapes that we might expect to see in this condition. They're very similar to the shapes that we saw pre-flashover, but we've just added an additional layer of damage throughout the entire space to account for that flashover transition. Again, if our origin-related damages during that pre-flashover development are close enough to these wall surfaces, we may impart some plume-related shapes on those surfaces, as well as a plume-related area of more substantial damage directly above that origin. Now's where things start to get a little complicated. We go into that post-flashover fire environment for a short period of time. And recall, our fire started here, but now that we're in that post-flashover fire environment, our compartment is full of heated fuel gases that are in need of oxygen. The only place they're getting oxygen is in that area associated with our vent, and therefore, this is where we meet the components of our fire triangle. This is where our flaming conditions exist. This is where we're imparting a great deal of damage in the space. If we put the fire out right now, we get these competing areas of damage, one associated with the origin and one associated with the vent. Now let's look at the exploded room diagram and the types of shapes that we would expect to see. And you can imagine that this starts to get a little more complicated sure. because we have those plume-related shapes uh, associated with origin, but we may also have these plume-related shapes associated with Definitely. our vent. Yep. Now we go into what I'm calling this middle duration post-flashover. So we're continuing to stack up our damages here in the area associated with the vent, and you'll see we're starting to diminish the distinguishability between our origin and these two other locations. So this heat condition, even though there's no good flaming condition back here because we lack oxygen, mm -hmm. this heat condition is starting to wash away those once distinguishable differences that may have been observable to us. And if we look at the exploded room diagram, you'll see uh, as depicted by the continued darkening of our damages associated with the vent, this is where we are really stacking up and accumulating our damage. And the origin-related damages are starting to fade into less prominence. Now we go into that long duration post-flashover. We continue to generate a lot of damage near our vent or associated with our vent. And we've lost or washed away the once distinguishable differences between our origin in quadrant one and these other two quadrants. Sure. And if we look at that exploded room diagram, it looks something like this. And this gets back to that concept that you addressed earlier, where our area of most damage in this particular case may very well be associated with our vent. It has nothing to do with origin. Okay. Yeah. And again, so while it is fine to do our examination and documentation and processing of our fire scene from least to most damage, mm -hmm. It's a perfectly acceptable approach. It does not mean that we found the origin. It simply means that we've collected the information that we now need to analyze to determine whether or not that area of most significant damage is origin or maybe it's 
Ventilation. Maybe it's ventilation, yes. So once again, to reiterate, we can put all of those diagrams on uh, our origin matrix sheet here, and this gives you a conceptual approach for thinking through uh, your analysis of fire scenes. And one of the things that's really important here that we've talked about previously is the issue of duration and how that impacts the magnitude of damage. So uh, underwriters laboratories did a series of experiments where they looked at flashover cells involving uh, legacy furnishings mm -hmm. versus modern furnishings. ATF subsequently did some similar testing at the uh, fire research facility just outside of Washington, D.C., and they got very similar results. But what you see here is that uh, when we compare the flashover times for legacy furnishings versus modern furnishings, and let me take a step back here and note that the legacy furnishings are typically more substantial wood products uh, where the padding might be something more like cotton batting. Okay. Uh, the modern furnishings much lighter weight, less substantial items that likely have polyurethane foam as padding. Sure. When we look at the difference or, or compare the flashover times between these types of furnishing setups, what we see is the modern furnishing setups resulted in flashover very, very quickly uh, on the order of three to four minutes. When we did a similar fire, same origin location uh, and, and same cause, the legacy furnishings took on the order of 30 minutes if flashover was achieved at all. And so this duration issue is really, really important because historically, fire investigators often went directly to the area of most damage, as you suggested, and said that was the origin. And historically, they were probably right more often than not. Why? because the, the origin-related pre-flashover damages were being imparted over a really long duration. There was 30 minutes or more of time to impart damage in our origin before the fire transitioned to the post-flashover conditions. Whereas in the modern furnishing condition fires, we may only have a few minutes where the fire is burning in our area of origin. That limits how much damage and how prominent those patterns can be before the fire transitions to a ventilation-related area. We've spent some time talking about some of the fire science principles, the compartment fire dynamics, and then how those compartment fire dynamics influence the damages that we see conceptually now let's talk about some actual real-world experimentation that we've done that supports the concepts that we've talked about so far. Sure. So let's start with a small-scale experiment. This is a small-scale uh, experiment that I completed, uh, I would say, roughly around 2010 time frame. And what we are looking at here is a, a small firebox with an open door that's offset from the center, much like we've talked about in our uh, hypothetical compartment fire. And here is a floor plan view of that box. It's about two feet deep by four feet wide with a two foot high ceiling. So it's roughly quarter scale by linear dimension. So if we were to scale that up uh, to full scale, it would be roughly eight feet deep by 16 feet long by eight feet high. A little bit of an awkward shaped room, but being the frugal government employee that I am, we utilized these dimensions because we could use full sheets of four by eight drywall without any waste. Sure. And again, we have an offset open door. When we look at this compartment in its constructed form, I have flipped this compartment over. So there is no floor on it, we're looking at the walls and ceiling from below at this point. And what we see here is that I've lined the interior of uh, this box with differing combustible wall linings. And what we have is uh, a 5 8 inch sheet of drywall that is the innermost layer. We've added a 1 8 inch paneling 
directly over that drywall surface. Then we have uh, a quarter inch uh, paneling furring strip. And then we add to that a one eighth inch pegboard. Okay. And so these quarter inch uh, furring strips allow for a gap to exist between the eighth inch paneling and the eighth inch pegboard. And why did you do that? So it's a bit of a long story. The idea was to do some small scale experimentation in an effort to either support or refute the concepts that we've talked about. And we initially did some experiments with just the drywall surface, but we were really getting, uh, having a difficult time getting the time scales lining up. So the fires that we created in this box would burn for so long mm. that they were creating unrealistic damage on our drywall surface, both pre and post, post flashover. So by adding these combustible layers, we got these fires in this small scale, small scale compartment to grow a little more quickly okay. and therefore be more in alignment with real world timescales. Sure. So one of the interesting attributes that we did with this experiment is inside we created a uniform wood grid and the reason we did this is because we wanted to have a uniform damage indicator throughout the entire volume of the space. Mm -hmm. So one of the challenges that you and I have as a fire investigator is rooms are full of furnishing, mm -hmm. furnishings, but they are also full of void space. Mm -hmm. And so we may have fire exposure conditions that exist in an area where there is no physical item to show subsequent damage to. And this experimentation allowed us to input this uniform wood grid so that we would have this uniform damage indicator throughout the entire volume of the space. Okay. Now, we created two different size grid members. The idea was that this would allow us to do both longer and shorter experiments. The uh, shorter experiments would not really show any significant damage on the larger wood grid members, okay. uh, but would show some differential damage on the smaller wood grid members. And then the longer duration fires would essentially disintegrate entirely the small scale or the small wood grid members, but uh, the more substantial larger members would still have enough remnants to show some differential damage. So this is our first fuel source okay. in the, that upper left-hand quadrant one that we've been talking about in our hypothetical compartment fire. What we've got in this particular instance is we're using gauze pads in plastic bags with a pre-measured quantity of gasoline. Now, our fire research laboratory utilizes these as uh, standard ignition packages sure. because they, they burn repeatedly the same way over and over and over again. So we, we put a small quantity of gasoline in the, the plastic bag, you add the gauze pad, you give it a little time, and the gauze pad will soak up the liquid gasoline, and then when you ignite the standard ignition package, again, it burns the same way over and over and over again. Sure. So we utilize these as a first fuel source. We have a technician here that is installing a nozzle system so that we can suppress the fire when we're ready. Outside here, I've got a fan that is simply being used prior to the fire to circulate air through that space. So I have some gasoline in plastic bags that are in that compartment right now, and if one of those uh, bags is leaking gasoline vapors, I don't wanna stick something in there and cause ignition. Um, and of those vapors and, and ultimately a potential explosion. So we're using this fan here pre-ignition simply to ensure that for safety purposes, we do not create an explosion. Okay. When the fire is ignited, that fan is no longer in place. Now we're looking at the doorway opening here. So the floor is comprised of that 1 8 inch paneling on a clean sheet of drywall. And we have sealed up with caulking all of the seams at floor level. Okay. And the reason for this is it's a ventilation study. We wanna make sure that there's no stray air or oxygen available to this space 
anywhere other than the doorway opening here. Here's our ignition port. This is in that upper left-hand quadrant where we ignite those standard ignition packages that are just inside. And you can see here I've got a piece of drywall with some caulking already pre-applied so that as soon as we ignite those standard ignition packages, we can seal that hole up and there's no air entering the compartment from that opening. And this is about two minutes into the fire condition. You can see we've got a lot of visible smoke coming from the compartment. If you could look in from this angle, you would see the flames and orange glow in that far quadrant where the fire started. This is roughly nine minutes, uh, nine to nine and a half minutes into the experiment. And you can see that we have uh, enough fuel vapor escaping this compartment and it's heated enough so that when it meets the fresh air, we're getting combustion of those fuel gases outside the compartment. When you look in here from the outside, it gives you the impression that you have wall-to-wall -wall floor to ceiling flames in, inside there. But again, that impression is misleading. Although you can see this little tunnel of fresh air that gives you some visibility into that space. Mm -hmm. So for all practical purposes, from nine to nine and a half minutes, uh, we have reached and gone through that flashover transition. Sure. So we allowed this fire to burn for another nine to nine and a half minutes. And then we extinguished it with those nozzles that were in place. Mm -hmm. So when you look at the total impact of the compartment, you have roughly nine to nine and a half minutes of pre-flashover burning and, and then into that flashover transition and then you have another nine and a half minutes on top of that in the post flashover fire environment. Okay. And what we ultimately did here is we took all the walls and ceiling surfaces and folded them out so we could create the exploded room diagram. And I'm gonna show you some close-ups of each one of these surfaces. So what we are looking at is the remains of the wood grid here. Mm -hmm. I've taken the flooring material, which is this 1 8 inch panel board, and I've put it on a clean sheet of drywall. So you can see this whitish area is actually where that flooring material had burned completely through. You can also get in a sense for the fact that this wood grid was carved out just inside the doorway. The wood grid back in further, uh, deeper regions of the compartment rather, was in relatively good shape. The only place that that wood grid was carved out and significantly damaged was just inside that doorway opening. And just as a reminder, our origin was at floor level in this upper left-hand quadrant number one. So we're looking at a view of the flooring material in this small-scale experiment. And ultimately what you see is in the yellow box here, that was our general area of origin. This here is our doorway opening, and this is the, the giant hole in the floor that was created just inside that doorway opening. Now, if we look at some of the wall surfaces, I've got a uh, direction of photo key up here. So we are looking at this front wall with the doorway opening on it. Mm -hmm. And I've drawn in yellow here some trend lines of demarcation on the wall surfaces. And what we see here is that on this particular wall surface, we have a trend line uh, that has some shape to it that would be consistent with a fire exposure in the area of our doorway uh, and spreading up and out from there. By the way, our origin would have been opposite this wall so this trend line is a pattern that is not particularly helpful in identifying area of origin. Now, if we look at this side wall here, we see a relatively symmetrical U-type shape of damage on that outermost pegboard wall surface. You can see the ignition port 
hole that was right here that was sealed up after ignition. And we don't necessarily see any uh, differential damage on this wall surface that would give us a clue that the fire started here versus here. Sure. Now when we look at this back wall surface, the wall opposite the doorway opening, we do have some clues here that are of potential interest in determining origin. So we've got this U or V type shaped pattern that exists in the outermost uh, wall surface material that is in direct line with our area of origin. But we've also started to create this U shape a little bit here just opposite the door. And we'll talk a little bit more about why that might exist in future slides. Now if we look at this D wall side, again we have a pattern trend line that would be more consistent with a fire exposure here uh, and, and traveling in this up and out direction, so a fire exposure in, in this area here rather than our origin. And here's our ceiling. Uh, this is the area of the ceiling that's directly above our origin. And ironically, it actually has some of the most significant material it's remaining yeah. above our area of origin versus other areas. Here's where the addition of these layers of wall linings became a really interesting result that I think is helpful for fire investigators. So in this particular set of photographs, what I've done is we're looking at this back wall here and I've delayered the wall linings. So this is that pegboard layer mm -hmm. that's now on a clean sheet of drywall. This is the subsequent panel board layer. And then this is the drywall layer that was below that. And what we see is on this back wall surface, we have a really nice U or V-shaped pattern on that outermost surface that corresponds with our origin. That's helpful. Again, we talked about how we might start to be generating something similar in shape, or at least conceptually similar in shape, on this region of the wall across from the door. But when we go to the next layer of material, what we see is something different. Yeah. We've actually got a different trend line. And you might not draw the exact same trend line that I do, but most people look at the trend line that I've drawn and they conceptually agree that there's less material in this region than there is over here. Mm -hmm. And that particular pattern corresponds more closely with this area across from the door rather than our origin. Sure. And then we look at the next layer, which is our deepest layer of drywall, and we've got this trend line here, which doesn't necessarily give us any good clues about origin. The one thing that we can see is this little spindle of damage here. But if you've ever worked with uh, wood paneling, you'll know that it has a tendency to split and crack along the, the linear uh, marks on the, on the board. Mm -hmm. And so it's possible that that's just a bit of a random split. Okay. It's possible that it's also associated with origin, but I would say the bulk trend line mm -hmm. does not give us anything really helpful pointing to our area of origin. So if we look at this set of results, we'd have to ask ourselves, what would happen if this fire burned a little bit longer to layer number one? Mm -hmm. What would you expect for the additional duration? How would it impact that material? Yeah, there'd be a lot less material there. Exactly, that layer might go away entirely. Right. And that one clue mm -hmm. that helps identify this area of origin it's is gone. gone. So a longer duration fire could take away that helpful pattern. Mm -hmm. Or if the fire service has to come in and do some overhaul, sure. and that layer goes away as a result of the overhaul work they need to do, mm -hmm. we would lose that helpful pattern. And we're left with these two subsequent layers that are less helpful. So what we really need is a little bit of luck in the sense that we need 
for every given fire scenario, a set of materials that doesn't damage so much that it goes away, mm -hmm. but damages enough to show us some helpful patterns relative to origin. So to help further illustrate this, I'd like to show you a video next of a small scale box experiment that was provided to me by Dr. Quintieri from the University of Maryland. And in this small scale experiment, you're gonna see a fire looking in through fire rated glass. And the fire is going to exist on top of a pan of heptane fuel. The heptane fuel is used because it burns very cleanly. So when you look in through that window port, you can see what's going on. Mm -hmm. And then you're gonna see flames on top of that. And what's important about this box is on the right hand side, you will see, uh, actually you can't see it, but there is a linear vent that allows some fresh air to enter the compartment. On the, the right hand side at the top, there's also a linear vent that allows heated gases to escape. And we end up with, at least initially, this flow path of fresh air entering and heated fuel gases exiting. So keep this diagram in mind as we transition to the video. We are looking into this small scale experimental box through a piece of fire rated glass. And you can see that we have a pan of liquid heptane fuel that's on fire inside the box. And if you recall from the previous diagram, you'll remember that there is a slit vent in this area here that allows some fresh air to enter down low. And there's also a slit vent in the upper regions of the box in this area here that allows the heated gases and smoke to escape. Now, as this fire develops, you can see that the flames start to lean over because of this inflow pushing on the flames. And we start to go through a phase of oscillation where we're in an instability. This fire doesn't have sufficient air after some time, and it ultimately goes through this period of oscillation as it's fighting for air and oxygen. And then we end up stabilizing in a new state after this instability. And you'll see here shortly, we end up with the flames migrating towards this slit vent. There it goes. So we've stabilized our flames along this slit vent. Now remember, the only physical fuel in here is this liquid heptane. Sure. So if you consider that to be your conceptual sofa, our flames have migrated from that sofa of origin to an area associated with our vent. This is just one more example of the fire behavior that we've been talking about that shows up in real life in this small scale experiment. Sure. The two small scale experiments that we just discussed reinforce two very important concepts that have been a theme so far throughout the presentation material. And the first concept is that there's a tendency for the fire to migrate from an area of origin to areas associated with vents. That's the first important concept. The second important concept is that that fire behavior translates into physical damages that you and I see at the scene. So if you recall, when we saw that small scale box with the wood grid inside, we carved a hole in the wood grid, not in our area of origin, it was in the area of the vent. Sure. So those two concepts are really important. And now let's move into some full-scale experimental results and share those with you and how they line up with the concepts that we've been talking about. This is a floor plan diagram from a series of full-scale tests conducted at the ATF Fire Research Laboratory over the last six or seven years. And what you're looking at is a residential sized compartment. There is a bedroom furnishing setup in this room here with a closet off the end and a long hallway to enter that bedroom. 
So at the beginning of the experiments, this door here is in the open position and this door here is in the open position. These two windows are in the closed position. They will eventually fail because of the fire conditions, but initially they are in the closed position. And so our flow paths fueling the fire of oxygen are generally speaking the heated smoke and gases that are generated by the fire in this room uh, rise to ceiling level. They flow down the hallway at ceiling level and out the doorway opening. And the opposing flow comes in with fresh air down low, down the hallway and into the compartment to fuel the fire. In this particular experiment, our fire originates in this area uh, marked with the number three. That in mind, let's look at some of the test data that we saw from that particular experiment. And this is a set of thermocouple tree data that's measuring temperature inside this compartment space in quadrants one, two, three, and four. And what we see is the temperatures stabilize or, or are at a steady state condition where we have a slow increase in temperatures as the fire develops. We then go through this instability known as flashover where things change really quickly and then we have high temperatures throughout the space floor to ceiling. And these two dotted lines here are representative of that time frame that we're going through this rapid change in temperature uh, that that would be indicative of the flashover transition. Sure. But the temperature profile doesn't tell the most important story. What tells the most important story is the heat flux profile in this compartment. So heat flux is slightly different than temperature and I want you to think about heat flux in terms of intensity of exposure. So the higher the heat flux, the more intense the exposure is. Not surprisingly, we started our fire here in quadrant two. So early on in our fire growth and development, we start to see a spike in the exposure intensity in that quadrant. Mm -hmm. And again, these dotted lines are representative of that flashover transition. When we get to the tail end of this flashover transition, we see something rather remarkable. And that is, the exposure intensities here in our area of origin begin to decline. Mm -hmm. At the same time, the exposure intensities are declining in our area of origin. They are increasing in this area associated with our vent, and you can see that in red here. Mm -hmm. This is actual quantitative data that represents the conceptual behavior that we've been talking about. Our fire exposures have transitioned or migrated from our area of origin to an area associated with our vent. And that's depicted here in this crisscrossing of activity uh, or exposure intensities in those two quadrants. And what that ultimately means is that when we go into this later stages of fire growth and development, we are going to continue to impart those damages in our area associated with the vent such that we can see some really remarkable patterns there. And I'm gonna show you some photographs from that particular test. And what you see here is, excuse me, this is from a slightly different test, same room setup, it was just a different furnishing set. But we are looking in the direction of the arrow that this is pointing to the doorway opening. We are seeing this wall and this wall here. And I've drawn in some trend lines in yellow. So the whitish areas here is all clean burn, which is representative of a more significant or greater magnitude damage than the darkened black areas. So we know clean burn to happen to drywall surfaces and the drywall surface goes through this phase of effects. Initially, a fire exposure is going to deposit dark soot onto the surface, which will have a tendency to darken the drywall surface. The next step with continued exposure is the heat, 
will cause charring of the paper surface and the paint surface such that it blackens and turns dark. Again, that would generate a dark surface color. And then with continued heat exposure, that paint and paper surface will experience mass loss and burn away or flake off such that the whitish, whitish substrate remains and that's what we see here in this uh, white visible markings on the wall and ceiling surface. And so we're seeing greater magnitude of effect on this wall surface where it's white than where it's black. And we see this same trend line that we've been talking about. Does it look exactly like what I've drawn on the computer? No, but the conceptual trend lines are the same. We've got this exposure condition just inside that doorway because regardless of where the fire starts in this room, when we transition through flashover, the exposure condition is here and it's creating all of this damage in magnitude and shape and location around the door. So there are some complications, and one of the things that I want to talk about is another set of experiments that shows something slightly different, and it has to do with the velocity of incoming fresh air. ATF, Underwriters Laboratories through their Firefighter Safety Research Institute, the International Association of Arson Investigators have all done many, many training programs where they create burn cells with an open door and they burn them and we often see significant damage on the wall surface opposite the doorway opening that is in fact associated with the vent flow. Okay. So one of the key aspects to note in these particular trainings is that this doorway opening is typically open to the exterior. Mm -hmm. So when that doorway open, opening opens directly to the exterior, it maximizes your inflows and outflows. In the last experiment that I just showed you, there was an additional hallway here. Sure. So the smoke and heated gases that were going out had to go through that long hallway, which is an essentially a, a friction tube that slows that flow down. And the fresh air that was coming into the space also had to go through that long hallway and was slowed down by that, that friction tube of a hallway. But in this case, this door is open directly to the outside. So it maximizes your inflows and outflows. And these inflows can come in with very significant velocity. Okay. Like on the order of um, a couple of meters per second, okay. very fast. And in doing so, when that fresh air enters this compartment in the post flash over fire environment, it has a lot of horizontal momentum associated with it. Okay. And so as it enters the compartment, it starts to mix with the heated fuel gases in that post flash over fire environment, but it's still moving in the direction towards the back wall and it's still mixing. And then by the time it burns, it pushes that exposure right into this wall surface opposite the door. So in many cases, our area associated with a vent is not necessarily right at the vent, but it's some distance into the compartment. And when we look at smaller residential sized compartments where this back wall is not that far from this open door mm -hmm. and this open door is directly open to the exterior, mm -hmm. these flows can push the exposure conditions right to that back wall. And I'll show you some results of a couple of those experiments. So you can see here, I've turned our diagram on, on its side to help line up with this lower diagram here that was generated by a fluid, uh, computational fluid dynamics model. But if we look at this back wall opposite the doorway opening, in a real world experiment, we saw this large, significant clean burn pattern on that back wall opposite the door. Mm -hmm. And that is a result of that fresh air inflow. When an ATF CFI modeled this using a uh, fire dynamics simulator. He was able to essentially capture the same behavior in the model. So this is that back wall mm -hmm. that is this back wall. This is the pattern that was observed in the real world. This is the 
intense exposure condition in red that the computational fluid dynamics model predicted. Hmm. So these line up quite nicely. And what you see here in this particular depiction is a slice of oxygen conditions in the space. So here's our open door. Here's the wall opposite the open door. Everything in blue is essentially 0% oxygen. Okay. Everything in red is essentially 21% uh, oxygen, which is ambient air. Okay. And everything that's in this greenish yellow is a mixture okay. of uh, somewhat depleted oxygen. And that is the interface between the heated fuel gases and the incoming oxygen where burning is occurring. And you can actually see that that burning occurs on that back wall, or, or the model predicts that burning to occur on that back wall. And that prediction is consistent with the actual physical damages that we see here. Sure. Now, I want to point out that in this particular case, the fire did not start here. Sure. It started elsewhere in the compartment. And this big clean burn pattern on this back wall is simply a result of the post flashover ventilation induced exposures that are associated with this vent. Now is this open to the exterior or is this that hallway that you had showed us before? Yeah, so in this particular uh, modeling setup, mm -hmm. this is open to the exterior. It is, okay. Here is some additional data from a test series that was conducted in Rochester, New Hampshire back in 2011. And as you can see from the diagram in the upper right hand corner, we have a compartment that's exactly like our hypothetical compartment we've been talking about. We've identified four quadrants in that space. We have this doorway opening that's offset from center. And it's a bedroom setup and we started our fire up here in quadrant one. And when we look at the heat flux measurements, and again, I want you to think of heat flux as exposure intensity. Mm -hmm. Not surprisingly, when you start the fire in quadrant one, you start to see spikes in the exposure intensity in that quadrant. Sure. And then these dotted lines represent that flashover transition. When we go through that flashover transition and get to the tail end, our exposure intensity in our area of origin declines dramatically. And that's because we're running out of air. The flashover transition has consumed the oxygen in that space. And our area of origin is deep within the compartment away from our vent. So it's oxygen deficient in that area and the exposure intensities decline because there's no oxygen to support flaming conditions back there. At the same time that happens, we see a dramatic increase in the exposure intensities in quadrant two. So we've always been talking about the area associated with the vent as being this quadrant three area. Mm -hmm. But what I wanna to stress to you is the area associated with a vent depends on the conditions. When this door is open to the exterior and this wall is not that far from the doorway opening, that area associated with a vent may literally extend well into quadrant two. It may be this whole half of the room. Okay. Let me take a step back. I want to talk about this particular wall surface here opposite the doorway opening and show you some photographs from the three experiments that were done with this test setup from Rochester, New Hampshire. We had three different origin locations. One was here, two was here, and three was here. Regardless of origin location, what we saw was a significant clean burn pattern on this wall surface opposite the door. And there it is in experiment one, experiment two, and experiment three. It happens over and over and over again. Why? Because it has nothing to do with origin. It has everything to do with the post flashover ventilation induced exposures. So this becomes the area associated with the vent. And what's fascinating is in experiment two, our fire actually started right here. In experiment one, it started over here, but that pattern 
looks just like this one. Almost looks exactly the same. Yeah. And even though in experiment three, the pattern doesn't look exactly the same, we are seeing a magnitude of damage that's similar in nature, meaning that we've, we've got some clean burn, and it's in a location that is opposite that door on the wall. It, it's a repeatable issue that comes up time and time again. So what does this mean for our matrix diagramming when it comes to smaller residential sized rooms? Well, pre-flashover doesn't change anything. We start our fire in quadrant one, that's where we're gonna have our damages initially. If we go through the flashover transition, we add a layer of damage throughout the space on top of what we had in the origin. But now when we go into the post flashover fire environment, because this door is open to the exterior, because this wall is not that far from the door, our area associated with the vent may be this whole half of the room, which encompasses both quadrants two and three. And then when we continue in that post flashover fire environment, our area associated with the vent includes both of these quadrants and we continue to stack up our damages there and we may wash away the once distinguishable differences that existed between our origin in quadrant one and this other uh, quadrant four. So what does that mean? Maybe in our matrix analysis, rather than a four quadrant system, we think about this doorway side as a section of its own. And we go through the process just the same. Pre-flash over, our origin starts in quadrant one, that's our damage. We add a layer of damage throughout the space to account for that flashover transition, but our area of origin is still the most significant and prominent source of patterns. Now we go into the post flashover fire environment and it's this whole section that is the area associated with the vent and is impacted by increased exposures and therefore increased damages and effects and patterns longer duration post flashover, we continue to stack up damage in this half of the room and we wash away the once distinguishable differences that may have existed between our origin and the other quadrant. We can do the same exercise that we did before with the four quadrant system. We're just using a three section system. Here's the depiction of a fire starting in quadrant one and we can put it all on one sheet of paper. And again, it's a very, very similar thought process with the simple recognition that if circumstances are right, the area associated with the vent, if it's a door that's open to the exterior, maybe that whole half of the room. Sure. So why in our small scale experiment where we had that wood grid in place, did we not see a significant pattern on the back wall? And I would argue, if you recall, we actually started to see on that first layer of pegboard a slight sure. yep. damage pattern. Mm -hmm. And then when we look at this second layer, we're actually seeing some trend lines of significant damage in that location just opposite the wall. But why didn't it, didn't it show up quite as neatly and clearly as it did in our full scale experiment? And I think that has everything to do with our wood grid. So in our full scale experiment, there was no physical item in that flow path to the back wall sure. to mm -hmm. disrupt that flow path. Mm -hmm. And therefore the energy of that incoming fresh air as it mixed with the heated fuel gases was carried right to the back wall. In our small scale experiment, that wood grid interfered with that incoming flow. Mm -hmm. That wood grid promoted increased mixing sooner. It slowed that inflow because there was an impediment there. And it had a tendency to keep our exposure conditions closer to the door than further into the room. That makes sense. So I believe that is the fundamental difference between what we saw in this small scale experiment and what we've seen in the large scale experiments. So let's transition now to a full scale experiment. It's a bedroom setup. And I'm gonna walk you through some of the post fire photographs and get an indication uh, from you as to some of the things that you see or notice for observations 
of damage effects and patterns as a fire investigator. And then we'll try to translate those into some meaningful discussion about where we think the fire may have occurred. Sure. So what you're looking at here is a single bedroom setup. I think the dimensions were roughly 16 feet wide by 14 feet deep. We have an open doorway here, um, a dresser, a, another dresser, a queen size bed, a chair, waste paper basket, and a nightstand. This particular fire was allowed to burn two minutes past the flashover transition. And that transition was identified to have uh, begun at approximately the four minute mark. And so we're looking at a total burn time for this fire of about six minutes, not a long time. Sure. So the arrow on our little key here depicts the direction at which we are looking at in the photograph. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I'm gonna ask you, Bill, what do you see in this photograph that are some effects and patterns or just plain old observations of interest? I'd say the top of the, the bedding right here, I'm seeing something in this area here. Um, looking up here at the top of the bed and comparing the slats at the top, they seem to have a, um, seem to kind of deteriorate as they move over here from, from left to right. Yeah, and so you've pointed out two things that virtually everybody points out when they look at this photograph. And this is remarkable to me because we haven't taken a single measurement, we haven't turned a shovel, mm -hmm. but the repeatability at which investigators take a look at this photograph and identify the same two things is remarkable. Uh, so I've drawn a trend line in here okay. to indicate uh, I see the same thing. I see additional consumption of material here, assuming that this bed was symmetrical to begin with. Yep. Um, but I see less material in this, this region here than I do up in here. Uh, and then I see the same thing here. I'm just going to show you that in a different photograph. So now let's look at... Uh, this particular angle, again, the arrow is pointing in the direction of the photograph. And you've pointed out that you saw a little bit of um, a trend line of demarcation on the slats, where the slats on the right side of the bed here were more damaged and more damaged lower than on this left side. Is there anything that you notice about the chair in this particular? It looks that there's more material on this side and less material here. Exactly, and this is another thing that fire investigators point out over and over and over again when they view this photograph. And I like how you worded that because the fundamental observation is not mass loss. Mm -hmm. The fundamental observation is I see less material on this side than I do here. And then if we know this is a symmetrical item to begin with, mm -hmm. then we may be able to interpret that fundamental observation to mean that there's more mass loss here than over here. Um, but again, you have pointed out some of the same things that other investigators point out. There's this trend line on the chair that shows some differential damage or consumption, more here and less here. Uh, and there's also this trend line on the uh, head of the bed. And uh, investigators, when they see photographs, uh, close-up photographs of this particular area, they also make note of the fact that the trash can is uh, almost entirely consumed to a point that you really can't see it anymore. Yeah. You know it's there because of the diagram, but you can't see it in the physical evidence mm -hmm. that remains. So now let's look at this back wall here. Uh, what do you notice about the coloration on this wall? Well, you have the clean burn throughout this entire area here, a pattern coming down this way. Yeah, exactly. And you've pointed out what virtually every fire investigator points out when they view this photograph, and that is this major clean burn pattern that has some shape to it. I've drawn some lines of demarcation that kind of give you a sense for the trending of that shape. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then let's look at this last photograph here where we're looking more on this wall here uh, where the dresser is. Yeah. You notice anything in particular there? I think what jumps out is this inverted position here. Exactly. And 
I've circled that because, again, this is something that fire investigators point out virtually every time I show this picture to them. Mm -hmm. And I'll also tell you that in person, uh, that particular pattern is a remarkable standout. Mm -hmm. When you walk in, that is so clean burned white mm -hmm. that you look at it and you say to yourself, what happened here? Mm -hmm. uh, so we've identified all of these issues or anomalies or areas of anomalous damage of significance. And here is the exploded room diagram that helps us see them all together collectively. And what we saw here is we had anomalous damage in this region. That's the one that you just pointed out, that, that clean burn. Uh, we had clean burn on the back wall surface. Uh, and then we also had these trending lines of damage on the headboard and the back wall and on the chair itself of differential consumption of materials. So if I were to think about this fire scene in terms of our origin matrix, I would divvy this up a little bit like this, where I've got these two sections here that are somewhat remote from my doorway opening, and then I've got this big section that I anticipate may be impacted by fresh air coming in through that doorway opening during the post-flashover fire environment. And I can think about this in shorthand. So I'm gonna hypothetically start my fire in this upper left-hand quadrant, and initially I am going to then add a layer of damage in that area simply by drawing some hash marks. Mm -hmm. Now, when I go through the flashover transition, I need to add an additional layer of damage on top of that throughout my entire space. And I do so with adding hash marks in a different direction. So if we put the fire out right now, I really expect my anomalous uh, damage effects and patterns to be in this area of origin. Now we go into the post flashover fire environment, and I know that this is where fresh air is coming into this space through the open door. And so I am going to add my additional post flashover damages in this particular area associated with my vent by again, drawing hash marks in a different direction. So this is where I get those competing areas of damage. I've got some anomalous damage back here in my origin, and then I've got some anomalies up here in my area associated with the vent. And then I need to understand that if I go long-term post flashover, I continue to add and stack up my damages here and I have to recognize that at some point, even though I don't have flames back here and my exposure condition is much less severe than this area, mm -hmm. I may begin to degrade and wash away the once distinguishable differences between my area of origin and this other space. So I find this, uh, this hand drawing method very valuable. I frequently try to get a floor plan diagram of my scene mm -hmm. very quickly, and I can photocopy it 50 times. And I can go through this thought process simply by drawing hash lines, hash marks. And it becomes a record of me having followed the scientific method. Sure. It becomes a record of how I considered, well, this might have been the area of origin, and here's the damages that I would expect to see. And then I do it again for an area of origin here and vice versa. Uh, so ultimately, what I come up with is I find myself in this region of my origin matrix analysis. So if my fire starts here and I continue through the flashover transition into the post-flashover fire environment, I get these two areas of competing interest. Mm -hmm. And we saw that in our actual photographs, right? We saw some differential damage that had some shape and trend lines associated with it, the chair and the bed that were of interest. And over here we saw two big clean burn marks, one on the back wall and one on this side wall. Um, so my natural reaction would be when I see that is the clean burn here on this wall and this back wall are in my area associated with the vent. Mm -hmm. So I may very well be able to attribute them to the post flashover ventilation condition. The anomalous damage that I saw back in this region in quadrant one 
is remote from my vent. Mm -hmm. I can't explain that anomalous damage from the post flash over ventilation flow. And therefore, I should start thinking about that as a potential area of origin for consideration. And sure enough, this is exactly where the fire started. You'll see that the bed was in fact made and pretty symmetrical, but what's interesting is your chair mm -hmm. was slightly asymmetrical in the oh. sense that there's a pillow here. Mm -hmm. So we actually had more material on this side to begin with, mm -hmm. and then we had less material on this side after the fire was out. Mm -hmm. And so I think that builds an even stronger case for a longer duration or more intense exposure condition or a combination of the two in this region here that was consistent with origin because we could not attribute it to the ventilation flow in the post flashover condition. Sure. So having discussed that full scale experiment, I'd like to wrap up with a few additional considerations that I think are relevant for the fire investigator to con to, to think about as they process their fire scenes. And that first consideration is doors versus windows. We've been talking about a hypothetical compartment fire that always involves doors. And I've showed you both small scale and full scale experiments in uh, conditions where we had an open door as a vent. Right. At times we are dealing with windows in combination with doors in the real world. And what we have to consider is that doors and windows are fundamentally different when it comes to ventilation because of their sill height. So our door generally extends right to the floor. Uh, and that is good for fresh air inflow because cool flows enter at the lower regions of the compartment. Our windows typically have a sill height that is significantly above the floor, maybe a couple of feet, maybe even three or four feet, depending on the type of window. So what you're looking at here in this diagram is an elevation view. We've got a floor here, a ceiling here, a doorway opening in this wall, and a window opening in this wall. If we get to a fire growth and development position where the hot upper layer descends such that its neutral plane is below the sill height of this window, this window is going to be entirely an exhaust because relative to the outside, this upper layer is at a positive pressure. This lower layer relative to the outside is at a negative pressure. And so in this case where our neutral plane has descended below the sill height of the window, our window becomes a unidirectional exhaust. So that's not a source of fresh air in our scenario as shown. Our doorway is a bi-directional vent, meaning that the upper portions that are above that neutral plane are exhausting smoke and heated fuel gases. Our lower regions that are below that neutral plane are the source of incoming fresh air. So doors are typically a very good vent for sources of fresh air in the post flashover fire event, as long as they're open. Sure. Uh, windows have a tendency not to be such a good vent for a source of fresh air. Now, some things that can impact that. If we look at windows that have a lower sill height, such that our neutral plane does not descend below that sill height, we may get some fresh air in the lower portions of that door. And if that fresh air enters this space in the post flash over fire environment, which may be full of heated fuel gases, we may get some localized burning right here. Mm -hmm. In fact, the Fire Safety Research Institute recently introduced a training program where you see some of that activity uh, resulting in damages in the post uh, flash over fire environment. Uh, but again, our doorway is typically a good bi-directional vent, meaning that it's a source of fresh air. Windows, maybe, maybe not. Doors and windows will be unidirectional or bi-directional, and it's largely dependent upon 
the height of the sill relative to the height of the neutral plane in the fire environment. But there are other factors that can influence the ventilation points of doors and windows, and that is wind. Mm -hmm. So in this particular depiction, we've got a wind coming at the side of the building where the window exists. Now previously, in the absence of wind, the neutral plane here is below the sill height of the window. So with no wind, we would expect that window to be entirely an exhaust. But if we have wind-driven forces, that window can become entirely an inlet. And if the forces are great enough, it may even force our doorway opening to be entirely an exhaust. So it could transition from a bi-directional vent to a unidirectional exhaust. And this is where we get into the discussion of, of flow paths that firefighters are really, really interested in when they're discussing their tactics for suppressing fires. But those flow paths are just as important to us as fire investigators because it dictates where oxygen is coming into our space and where that oxygen comes in is where we're going to have fire exposures associated with those vents and therefore damages associated with those fire exposures. We've been spending some time talking about doors and windows because those are the typical points of ventilation that we are going to see, but they are not the only points. And I want to share with you some test results related to HVAC ventilation. So you've seen this floor plan before. This was part of a test series that was conducted at the ATF Fire Research Laboratory. And what I'm going to show you is some photographs of this region in the compartment right here. And in this region, there is an HVAC vent that is connected to a bunch of ductwork that flowed directly to the outside. There was no forced mechanical ventilation associated with that ductwork. Um, so incoming fresh air that made it into the compartment through that ductwork was simply a result of the fire flows. Okay. So again, we're gonna look at a photograph in this direc direction on this diagram, looking at an HVAC vent in the wall right here. Pre-fire, what you see is that HVAC vent grate. Mm -hmm. Now during the post flashover fire environment, there was fresh air coming into this opening because we could measure the flow in the ductwork and that fresh air clearly mixed with heated fuel gases because we got burning right in this region. The camera picked up flaming conditions. Mm -hmm. And after the fire is put out, you can see the vent grate right here, but you can also see a clean burn pattern that is very distinct on the wall surface just above that vent grate. Mm -hmm. And I believe that this is a perfect example of a ventilation point that we might overlook if we're not careful. Sure. Because that pattern, if we don't recognize that it could have been produced by this vent flow, then we might start hypothesizing that it's an origin. Mm -hmm. And in this particular case, if we did so, we would be wrong. Sure. So we have to recognize that HVAC vent as a point of potential ventilation. Absolutely. The last consideration I'd like to talk about before we wrap up is this concept that many of the patterns and effects that lead us back to origin are not necessarily associated with the primary fuel package. They may be associated with the secondary fuel package. And as a result, they get us close to the origin, mm -hmm. but not directly to the origin. So what do I mean by that? Uh, let's take a look at the case where we have a trash can fire next to a sofa. Sure. I'm going to stand up a wall surface here, and I'm going to take uh, a hypothetical sofa here and put it up against the wall. And then I'm going to take this hypothetical trash can and put it right next to the sofa. And so if we were to have a fire in that trash can, Initially, as that trash can burns, because it's right up against a wall surface, mm 
that burning fire is going to impact the wall surface and create a bit of some flame damage directly on the wall surface. Sure. You with me so far? Yep. The next step is the plume that's coming off that flame may impact the wall surface and create a little bit of a plume pattern on the wall surface. Yep. But the trash can fire is relatively small. The trash can itself is not going to transition us through flashover. Sure. We're gonna have to get a more significant fuel package such as the adjacent sofa involved. Yeah. And typically speaking, we might need to get you know, anywhere from a third to half or even a little more of this sofa involved to transition through flashover in a typical residential space. So until we transition to the sofa, this is the pattern that we might expect to see on the wall surface. As we continue pre-flashover to expand our fire into the sofa, we may add a larger plume. So before the sofa gets involved, we've got this plume pattern. And then as the sofa continues to get involved, we may add this larger plume pattern on top of it. Right. So when the fire's out and our firefighters have, you know, thrown these items out the window during overhaul, we're left with this pattern. And this gets us pretty darn close to the origin. We've got a wide base here that gets us close to the origin because it includes the trash can that was within the base of this plume. Now let's consider a different scenario where our trash can is not up against the wall surface. Our trash can is, say, away from the wall surface at the front of the sofa. Mm -hmm. What's going to happen in this particular case is the first few minutes of the trash can burning, we are not close enough to a wall surface to impact it in any significant way to create an observable pattern. And so this particular trash can is then going to have to extend to the sofa. And then when the sofa gets going, we're gonna to have to get maybe roughly a half of it going before we transition to flashover. So we're gonna get a really good plume pattern associated with the sofa. And now when these items are taken away during overhaul, we're left with this pattern and we have an origin pattern that may lead us to believe the fire originated on the sofa when instead we actually originated further out. The primary fuel package was the trash can. The secondary fuel package is the one that imparted the okay. fire pattern that helps us find the origin. Sure. And so the takeaway or lesson learned from this is remember these origin related patterns have a tendency to get us close if we interpret them accurately, but they may not get us exactly to the right fuel package. Sure. So we need to expand the area in which we are considering a little bit beyond what that pattern may lead us to believe. Sure. So that wraps up the material, I think you had a few questions you wanted to discuss before we move on. So as we talk through all of this and we talk about the quadrants and um, some people in fire investigation would say that once a compartment goes to full room involvement or flashover that these patterns don't survive and that, I mean, you've clearly showed us today um, that that's not the case. Yes, I think an important takeaway here is that Origin-related effects and patterns can and do persist past flashover. The key element to consider is the relationship of the origin location to the areas associated with vents. An origin location that is located remote from ventilation points is going to produce patterns that will persist longer than if that origin location is closer to an area associated with vent or even in the area associated with vent. Sure. But the bottom line is that there is an opportunity for fire patterns that, that are associated with origin to persist past flashover. Yeah. And sometimes people are referred to as the, the Carmen study. There, in 2005, I believe, there was an agent that uh, did a research project and just kind of tell us about that and how that's progressed over time. 
Yeah, so in discussing that particular study, if I recall correctly, it was a paper that was written in the International Association of Arson Investigators publication. Uh, I think it, it's relevant to discuss some of the history. So we at ATF started developing an understanding for these concepts in the late 1990s. And in the early 2000s, we began to uh, teach these concepts and explore them a little further through testing. So Steve Carmen, who was one of our retired CFIs, along with Michael Marquardt and, and several other ATF personnel, undertook a training program where they generated a compartment fire for training purposes. Mm -hmm. And they gave that to a population of students and asked them to identify the quadrant of origin based on a quick visual examination of that scene. The results were not particularly good in that very few people correctly identified the quadrant of origin. And that particular publication or study has been used uh, to, in an effort to state that the error rate associated with fire investigation is very, very high. Sure. And that's problematic because that training program was not a real world representation of actual fire investigation activity. So the statistics that were generated by that study are limited by several factors. The first was that many of the so-called investigators that were looking at that scene were not trained fire investigators. Right. Second of all, the uh, participants were not allowed to identify an area of origin different than a quadrant. So they couldn't say the room, uh, excuse me, the fire originated on half of the room. They couldn't say the fire originated in the room. They had to, they were forced as part of the training exercise to pick a quadrant. Third, the investigators were not allowed to come up with an undetermined origin location, which is something that happens in the real world. If an investigator is not confident with the potential solution, they're gonna leave it undetermined. Sure. And finally, the last uh, issue that's problematic with that statistic is that the investigators were not allowed to follow the scientific method that you and I would utilize in real world practice. They were not allowed to dig the scene, they were not allowed to interview any potential witnesses, and they were not allowed to look for or consider any additional relevant information that might have been available associated with that fire. So bottom line is that particular study is valuable in the sense that it demonstrated we have some work to do in fire investigators because we'd like to see a quick look at the fire scene nudge us into the direction of the correct answer, and it didn't in that case. But it's not representative of real-world fire investigation error rates because of all those issues that I cited. Great. Well, thank you so much for coming out and, and doing this, and we really appreciate it. And hopefully everybody uh, takes the time to check out the presentation. Any questions, uh, we'll put up your contact information and they can reach out to you. Well, I appreciate you having me, and uh, I look forward to the questions and comments. Thanks, buddy. Thank you.